Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Tonight, the topic is the future of Mississauga, city planning, and also, frankly, cities, uh, you know, I think elsewhere across uh, across Canada. Our, our guest is Brent uh, Totterin. Uh, he is really quite an interesting gentleman. He has uh, had a successful career, very successful career, as the chief planner in the city of Vancouver. Before that, he was with Calgary. Before that, he was in Ontario. And uh, in the last couple of years, he's launched his own independent consulting firm on city planning. And uh, and, and he speaks around the world uh, about what we should be doing uh, in regards to city planning. Uh, there's almost a thousand people, over 900 people that uh, on Wednesday night came out to Living Arts Centre of Saga to listen to him uh, speak about what we got to do in the next 50 years in Mississauga. Brent Todd, welcome to the show, sir. My pleasure. Nice to be here. My uh, my pleasure, uh, because I thought it was a really interesting conversation. I was in the audience, and uh, and it was interesting. You 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 addressed a lot of sort of some of the big issues that have been uh, topical in Mississauga, uh, particularly at uh, at community meetings and city planning and things like that, in regards to height density, uh, parking ratios, and other things. Uh, yep. And you made some interesting comments in regards to people shouldn't be as worried about height and density as uh, as I think often they are. Tell me, if you could, a little bit about that point that you tried to make. Well, first of all, I did cover a lot of ground, but I started it and I start all my presentations by connecting the dots to the bigger picture, why we even need to have a conversation about changing our cities. And I call it, I call them the five crises that every city, not only in Canada, but around the world are facing and trying to tackle through better city making. The climate crisis, the housing crisis, the social equity, racism and classism crisis that plays out in how we plan and zone and design our cities and communities. The public health crisis that is about how we've designed physical activity out of our cities and particularly our suburbs and made them largely car dependent. And the public infrastructure cost crisis with its crippling per capita infrastructure costs that uh, really have to do with how we've been planning low density, separated, car dependent places that are the most expensive places we've ever built from a public cost perspective because of how much infrastructure they take and actually how relatively little tax generation they they produce. And that leads to the conversations we have in almost every budget cycle about the potential for in increasing now double digit tax increases. So all of these five crises are playing out. And a big part of the solution of all five is how we build our cities and particularly our suburbs. So yes, I talk about density and urban design and height and transportation and the car. I talk a lot about the future of cars. It's not an anti-car message, but it's, a, it's an anti-car dependency message. Surely we can't have the car as the only rational choice in our cities and suburbs. And uh, I talk about urban biking. I talk about public transit. I talk about walkable cities. I talk about um, a lot of different things, but I connect the dots constantly to those five crises. And I, part of my work, I get, I get called in by cities that want to do it differently, that want to have a more responsible city building and suburb building but they don't necessarily know how to do that or where to start. And they also want to have a different conversation with their community about it. So, so yes, to, to get to your specific question, uh, I often talk about what I call a fear of heights. There's a lot of cities out there that are ideologically or even dogmatically uh, uh, afraid of tall buildings. Often the only conversation we have about urban design in cities is whether the buildings are tall or, or less tall instead of having a conversation about all the elements of good urban design. So I do challenge cities to think about how we do buildings of every scale, short, medium, and tall, better uh, in a way that strengthens the streets, promotes walkability, uh, does all connects the dots to all those public interests and all those crises. And just one, just one of the elements is how tall the buildings might be. But I don't need to tell you that often a lot of the conversation comes down to maybe three things, how tall the building is, the parking, and just the cars in general, and whether or not uh, whether or not you can add, fit more cars as you're trying to fit more people into our cities. Why has uh, height become this big issue? Uh, you know, I've spoken to several of an architects, and I don't know if you agree with them, but they've told me that after five or six stories, people can't really tell how how tall the building is. They don't really notice it. 
that the scale on the street is uh, the first few floors. And I think you talked about podiums a little bit uh, mm-hmm. and, 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 and not having uh, blank sure. walls and things like that. Uh, in your in your talk um and you know i've talked to to developers and 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 architects that say if we want to increase density the easiest way to get it is add 10 stories well especially if you're already doing a building like a podium uh and then you're going taller because as as many will say being taller doesn't necessarily mean being denser because maybe you're not using the whole site uh but you know that the truth of the matter in most cases is if you're going taller, the best reason to go taller is to add your density, add more people, get more people on less land and support public transit, support more complete communities where you have the population density to have local grocery stores and local schools and local daycare instead of having to drive further distances. But it's funny you would say that, that that you've, you've heard architects say that. There's a lot of ideology and dogma in the professional classes around height, there are some who say what you just said. If you you can't really tell much about the building over the first few floors, there the, there's other architects. There's literally a famous architect out there who says there's a special level of hell dedicated to architects who design buildings over five floors, and that is ridiculous dogma, ridiculous. And and so that ideology gets in the way of better design. The truth is neither of those statements is true. It's not evil to do taller buildings. And also, you often can uh, really obviously notice that a building is taller above the first couple of floors. The key variable is design. If you design a good tall building, it works really well. Vancouver, and I don't try to talk, I try these days not to talk too much about Vancouver because I often get the, oh, look, it's the Vancouver guy coming to town and he's got to you know, tell us we should be like Vancouver. I've worked in probably 500 cities around the world, including many that frankly do planning and design and multi-mobility better than Vancouver does. But what Vancouver has done particularly well, one of the things that made Vancouver, the model, the Vancouver model of city building famous is they took a podium, a mid-rise podium, five, three, four, five, six stories that creates what we in the business call the human scale. And that gives you the sense of, your environment when you're on the street. You have good active uses at grade, at eye level, the stores or the or the entrances to, to homes that is interesting and provides what are called eyes on the street for safety. The scale of the mid-rise buildings sort of frame the street, almost like an urban room. And then the tall towers in Vancouver are stepped back. They're separated from each other and they're thin. They're thinner generally. And, and Mississauga's are very much like Vancouver's because Mississauga copied Vancouver's model and so does that uh, very well. And so the idea is that the tall buildings aren't what create your experience at at the street. It's the mid-rise buildings and you get the benefit of the density of the tall buildings and you get the benefit of the scale of the mid-rise buildings and it's sort of the best of both worlds. It's literally the reason other than things like green building design and good public transit and walking, biking, It's that building model that has really made Vancouver not just North American famous, but world famous, because that model works particularly well. And it's if you're going to do height, I've even heard some of the most famous naysayers of tall buildings in the world, famous urban design and architectural naysayers, will literally say, and they've said it to me, I still don't like tall buildings, but if cities do tall buildings, they should do them like Vancouver does, because there is a better way to do tall buildings. By the way, I often point out that yes, there are horrible tall buildings out there. I showed examples in my in my presentation, you recall. But there's also horrible mid-rise buildings out there and horrible short buildings out there. So the key is to make sure that you do good design that's very urban as opposed to suburban. It strengthens your city, your neighborhood, your street, your block. Uh, instead of turning its back to them with blank walls and 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 and. Uh, and um, harsh treatment to the sidewalk and the pedestrian. So a lot of this is about architectural design, urban realm design, public realm design, urban design, and how to do density well. Part of my message on Wednesday was the elements of how to do density well and also how to do height well. We've got this issue in Mississauga. Uh, clearly, we've got a housing crisis, which is one of the crises that uh, you identified. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, 
And Mississauga still has a little bit of land available, but not much. Uh, it's mm. pretty uh, built out uh, with single family homes um, over covering the vast majority of the of the land. Uh, and we do have the benefit of uh, go train access to downtown Toronto uh, and uh, the Huron Ontario LRT that uh, is under construction right now. So we've got higher order transit and uh, transit stations available. And I presume and one coming. of the things that you're recommending is that we build height around those transit nodes. Um, how do we build good height around those transit nodes? And how do we how do we combat uh, or deal with the the neighborhood uh, opposition to that height around those neighborhoods? And, and you know, there's been um, big opposition to height around the Port Credit GO train station, around the Cooksville GO train station, around the Clarkson uh, GO, GO train station, et cetera. Um, and those are, you know, GO train stations with thousands and thousands of people that are that are jumping on the train to go to work in downtown Toronto. Well, in Mississauga's downtown, you want density and you want height. You want people living there. And boy, I'll tell you, I've been doing downtown revitalization for 32 years, most of my career. And downtowns are particularly struggling post-pandemic because of the body blows that they took during the pandemic, but also because of the transformative change around work from home. So one of the underpinnings of urban places, that those are places where people go to work. Well, that's been shaken by the work from home phenomenon. And nobody's really sure how that's going to settle yet. It's still in flux. And I often say anybody who says they know exactly how that's going to end up is wrong, but I just don't know by how much in what direction. So you need to make sure that you have create, created nimble strategies. But we know that more housing because you're gonna have less office, it brings people there to make the downtown vibrant, not just during the workday, but all day, all night, on weekends, all year, et cetera. So it brings body heat that creates life in your downtown and your urban places. The same is true in your other urban places, not just your downtown, because Mississauga is a former suburb that is still has many suburban parts, but it has many urban parts now too. And those urban parts are getting better every year. They're getting a little less car dependent, a little more walkable, bikeable, complete, et cetera. And one of the reasons you want that completeness is so that people don't have to own a car to go far, but it's also uh, tied to that transit infrastructure. And you mentioned Go Train, but of course the Huron Ontario LRT is open. They just referenced um, that the, the Ford government uh, seems to be putting the the downtown loop back on the table in terms of that uh, really, really important infrastructure. Plus, uh, the Bloor Street bike lane was just passed, and extremely controversial, but every smart city in North America is having the conversation about urban biking as a way, as a part of the multimodal uh, city building. Hamilton just announced that they're going to be doubling the speed of their of their uh, implementation of biking infrastructure. So the cities you're competing with are, are frankly outpacing Mississauga on some of these proven smart things. So all of these conversations are happening at once. And a lot of it is landing right around the, the GO train station areas and the LRT station areas. And even your BRT, you've got BRT too. So you're, you're a city that's becoming more and more uh, mixed use, more and more multimodal more and more choice, less car dependency, doesn't mean you won't or can't drive, but it means you don't have to drive for everything. And maybe you don't need the second or third car, and maybe you have an electric bike in one car or even two. You know, there's all sorts of household scenarios that are starting, starting to play out because Mississauga is evolving. It's really, and, and, and when you say, how do you address that pushback? Well, infrastructure for transit is a game changer. There's just no way that governments invest millions or even billions of dollars on infrastructure and then say, well, but we're going to keep it low density and thus not have the ridership that actually makes that infrastructure pay off. So it's like uh, peanut butter and jelly. Uh, they, density and transit, they need each other. They work together. They always go together. So whether or not it's, it's a particular approach to height, because height is one way to do density. You could do what are called perimeter block 12 story buildings, or you could do thinner 25 story buildings. There's, and you, you wouldn't necessarily want to do the exact same approach in Cooksville versus Port Credit. You know, there's going to be 
some contextual conversations. But what there won't be is an ability to say, no, thanks. We don't want density next to our LRT station. We don't want density next to our um, our GO train station because it's one of the great no brainers and it's one of the great must haves in city building. So you're going to get density. The question is, are you going to do it well or not? Well, and I think that's a big issue because I, I do fear that a lot of people have said uh, they don't want the density and and uh, and and for sure they don't want the height. And so therefore what we've ended up with too often is short squat uh, type uh, density rather than that tall, thin, uh, beautiful uh, towers that uh, that some people uh, would think are far, far better. And I've seen, you know, alternatives uh, presented uh, that this is the short squat and the tall, thin, and they have the same density and one you know, someone described as a Soviet block uh, type of uh, structure and someone, you know, something else is a, a quite a beautiful structure. Anyway, we got to take a break for some messages and we're going to be back in two minutes with ben Ta Brent Totter and talking about the future of cities and the future of Mississauga and uh, what makes economic sense. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour Saga 96. We're talking with Brent Totteron today, a city planning expert. He's uh, the former chief planner in uh, Vancouver. Before that, he was with Calgary. Before that, he was in Ontario. Uh, and he came to Vancouver. He came to, sorry, Mississauga uh, last Wednesday to uh, make a presentation about the next 50 years in Mississauga. I want to turn, Brent, if I could, to this um, cost of infrastructure crisis that you mentioned. And I don't think it was something that a lot of people realize. I wonder if you could explain it. Uh, to us. So what you were saying is that we've come to the realization that suburban uh, sprawl is far more costly than dense urban uh, development. Um, and I don't think a lot of people sort of understood that. They thought that, uh, frankly, the cities are where we're spending all the money. And and what you're suggesting is really to, I guess, to expand sewers and water and uh, roads and all that kind of stuff. It's the suburbs where we're spending an inordinate amount of money. Well, it in fact, we have known this for a while, but it's almost seemed for years, I've, it's been well understood in the profession since I started my career 32 years ago. But I got to tell you, it's been almost strangely taboo for much of my career to, to talk about it. Uh, because it's somehow, well, you're being mean to the suburbs and by telling the truth about how much things actually cost. And that probably changed mm, about um, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, it actually started changing while I was at the city of Calgary, uh, because I was in charge of both inner city infill and suburban infill in Calgary. And um, Calgary was one of the very first cities to do what was called a cost of growth study. To, because the question was, does growth pay for itself? Or is, is growth being subsidized by the existing residents? And I remember the day I was asked by a counselor that question, does growth pay for itself? And I said, that's a really important question, but an even better question is what kind of growth pays for itself and what kind of growth doesn't? And Calgary was one of the first cities to do a cost of growth. Now just about every Canadian city has done it. And I work around the world and Canada is actually a world leader in doing this kind of math. And I often say that once you've done this math and once you've learned this, you can't unlearn it. Because if you're not motivated by the climate emergency when it comes to better city making or the housing crisis when it comes to better city making or public health or equity and, and classism, you're probably motivated by money because most people are. And you probably care how much you're paying in taxes. And the truth has always been this. P people in the suburbs think the city... They are somehow subsidizing the city. The opposite is true. The more low density and single use and car dependent you are, the more you are being subsidized. It's essentially your city building socialism where your taxes are being kept low, uh, artificially low, subsidized by the urban places, which by far generate the highest tax income. They are the taxation engines of a city in a city region. At the same time, the per capita costs of all the infrastructure, hard and soft services, much, much lower in the inner city than they are in the suburbs. And you know that our taxes are done in a way it's based on how much your, your, your home is worth, not, not based on how much your home costs to the public. So we have a very strange and perverse uh, system of taxation. So the places that actually cost less for the public are paying more in taxes per square foot.
It's a pretty good deal for the suburbs, I tell you. And if you live in the suburbs, you probably don't want to hear this. And you sure don't want it to change because why would you want to lose that socialism that's helping you out? But that's the truth. And, and more and more cities, about 10, 15 years ago, cities started saying, well, you know what? We're going to tell the truth about it. If you want to say, but I like living in the suburbs, well, that's okay. You can say that. But you also have to understand that you're being subsidized. And if you do live in the suburbs, what I tell to Mississauga residents, if you live in the suburbs and then you want to stay living in a low density place and you want to keep driving your car, which costs way more per kilometer driven uh, for the public than any other way of getting around by far. So suburbs are subsidized and car driving is subsidized. If you want to keep doing that, the best thing you can hope for is for your city government to approve more density in the urban places on public transit and where people can walk and bike because they are subsidizing you. They are helping keep your taxes low. That is just a mathematical fact. So when you, when you talk about it that bluntly and honestly, you know, people can still say, well, but I like the suburbs. Well, fair enough. You like the suburbs. You like driving your car, but, but the people who are subsidizing you, have a right to say, well, but wait a minute, at least don't object to density, at least don't object to a bike lane that's actually saving public money, not costing public money, at least don't object to public transit, because those things are the things that are actually generating the taxes that actually allow your suburban car dependent lifestyle to be as low tax as it is. And if you think your taxes are all going up right now, they'd be going up even more without those urban places. But but Brent, let's call a spade a spade. The reality is those neighborhoods do object. Um, sure. And, uh, and, and you know, you uh, had uh, not all the councillors, but numerous councillors in the audience uh, on uh, Wednesday night. And uh, they listened to their residents uh, because those residents are the squeaky wheel. And uh, they're the ones that go out and uh, low turnout elections and vote. And so the only way they can keep their jobs is if they listen to their residents. And those residents, by and large, um, probably aren't the people that were in your session on Wednesday who are more uh, interested in the future. They're the people that are complaining at residence uh, meetings, at, uh, at planning meetings, at council meetings, et cetera, saying, not in my backyard. Don't build that density here. I don't, I want, I want my, my suburban neighborhood to stay the way it always has been. Well, I gotta say, you're right, but I gotta say, uh, the size of the crowd, uh, that came out got me curious because it's that's a much bigger crowd than the usual suspects of city planner types and a number of people came up to me there's always a lot of people who want to talk after the event is over and i gotta tell you a surprising number of people came up to me and said i've never been to one of these before uh i never really thought about any of this but somebody one of my neighbors said you should go to this and so i did and now I'm really interested and I don't think I'm not, I'm going to be able to not think about this anymore. And I said, that was about the nicest thing you could say to me because you know, that the actual goal uh, and including having a conversation with you is to get past the usual suspects who, um, who already know this stuff to the broader audience that is busy. They've got better things to do with their time than come out to a planning lecture. They've got kids. I've got young kids. So um, how do you get this information out there? And it doesn't mean it will change people's minds. Frankly, to be blunt, there's a lot of self-interest built into the existing commentary about change in cities. People don't want it to change because they like it the way that it is. And I just explained to you that they're benefiting financially from the way that it is. So there's, there's financial self-interest there too although not in the way they think. Their property values aren't going to go down. That's what I always hear. That's not true. But frankly, you know, you, they're being subsidized by the urban places in their taxes. And that is true. So this is never going to be an easy conversation. And, you know, I've never been to a single city, including Vancouver, including Paris, including any city I've worked in around the world, where this conversation is easy. But this conversation is necessary everywhere. If we take sustainability and the climate emergency seriously, we've got to think differently. If we take the housing crisis seriously, we've got to think differently. If you want to 
be justified in, ex in, in criticizing the municipal tax increases that you keep facing. You got to you got to understand how this actually works. So and I want to be really, really clear. Nothing I talk to about says we're not going to do suburbs anymore. There's there's going to be suburbs in Mississauga for much longer than you and I are alive. But there's a better way to do suburbs. There's a better way to do the inner city. There's a better way. We're doing better cars in the context of things like um, um, electric vehicles. But the answer isn't just electric, better cars. It's got to be less need to drive and more choices, more options and alternatives that actually allow more people to move as the city grows with less space and less public cost. That is the truth. And what I always say is, if you want to live in the suburb, you're still going to be able to. And frankly, you're still probably going to be subsidized. If you want to drive your car, nobody's going to stop you. But the best thing you can hope for is that your neighbor on one side decides to get an e-bike and your neighbor on the other side decides to take public transit and the neighbor behind you decides to walk. And they're only going to do that if the infrastructure is there to make that safe and enjoyable. And if they do that, that means they're not in front of you stuck in traffic fighting for the same amount of finite space. What I talk about works better for everyone. It works better for the city from an economic development perspective, from a taxation perspective. It works better for everyone, including drivers. Designing for cars works badly for everyone, including drivers. Because if everybody drives, nobody moves. That's the traffic you're always stuck in because you're not fighting for space with other people. You're fighting for space with their cars. And they're they're spending your public money. They're generating the climate emergency and, and they're taking up all the space. So the more people choose, not are forced to, but choose the other things, the better it is for everyone, including the people who are going to keep choosing to drive. So this narrative about the so-called war on the car is a lie. It's manipulative. It's done. I know the politicians who do it. I've worked with politicians my entire career. They're lying to get votes. They're lying to get you mad. Or some in the media are lying to get clicks because, hey, if it bleeds, it leads. But the truth is, I'm talking about not anti-car. I'm talking about pro-smart city. I'm talking about the difference between smart and dumb cities, the cities that succeed or the cities that fail. Well, you know, if we, uh, if, if every single person that takes the GO train to get to from Port Credit or uh, or Clarkson uh, to get to downtown uh, got on the Gardner Expressway and the QW yeah. in a car today, there's no way that we could get there. It's the only way that uh, that that place works is uh, by putting uh, absolutely it, uh, the only way any of our cities a thousand work people on a go public train. transit works i that's the, i love the math of it that you know the, here in vancouver the sky train line replaces i think it's 18 lanes of traffic that we could never build even if we wanted to and if we did build it it would be terrible for the climate emergency etc and well, it would cost know, uh, a staggering amount more you may know a planner by the name of Joe Barrett at uh, oh, yeah. Strategies, and he came to a Mississauga City Summit uh, session that we had about a decade ago and said, uh, Houston, sort of the same size as Toronto, not anymore, but was at the time. Uh, and going into downtown Houston was uh, 40 lanes of freeway traffic. Going into downtown Toronto was 12. Uh, yeah. And he said, uh, not only is it the lanes, but it's all the parking. So cars, yeah. pollution, parking, uh, and uh, lack of livable, walkable, enjoyable city with all that uh, with all that laneway space. Uh, I got to ask you, though, you know, we're talking about density. We're not talking about density everywhere. The vast majority of suburbia is going to just stay the same, isn't it? It's going to be just around transit stations and on major arterials, is it not? Well, we're not talking about the same density everywhere. As you know, uh, Mississauga Council recently passed in order to get access to the accelerate housing accelerator funding. They passed a zoning uh, that would allow up to four homes per lot. That's that's density. That's more homes on less land. And it, that helps keep your school open. That helps keep your local shopping open uh, so that you so it doesn't close and you have to drive even further. It certainly helps keep your taxes low, et cetera. So it's all beneficial. But that's what I call gentle density. Uh, I when I was having these conversations in Vancouver, I used terms like gentle density to talk about row houses and semi-detached houses and maybe four plexes or three plexes. I talked about what I called hidden density to talk about laneway houses that are tucked in behind 
and access from a lane or a side drive. I talked about invisible density, which is just another way of talking about secondary suites in your primary house. You can add homes, options for people, while relatively having relatively little change. And my friend in, in, in California, Daniel Parolik, coined the term the missing middle housing. And it's actually a better brand than my gentle density. I actually like it better. But it it's talking about the housing types that are missing. If all we have are detached homes and apartments in mid-rise or high-rise buildings, we're missing the option of all those other housing types that might allow the aging couple to downsize in their neighborhood without having to move to another neighborhood. Then they can give their primary house to the kids and the grandkids, which helps keeps the school open in the neighborhood and means you don't only get to see your grandkids once a month because they live way, way out in the suburbs because they had to drive till they qualify. You know, there's all sorts of ways that it actually makes neighborhoods more diverse, more nimble. It actually stabilizes neighborhoods from keeping the, the school from closing and the shopping from closing. So we have this strange idea that if we stop change, it'll protect our quality of life. When the truth is, change always happens. You can't stop it. And often the change that's happening isn't very good. The population in your neighborhood is dropping and your school might be under threat of closure because they want to close three schools and consolidate into a larger school that you have to drive to. Change is constantly happening. And when you actually provide more choice in your neighborhood, then you can actually end up stabilizing the thing you have, which is the school that you can walk to or the shopping that you can walk to. But I tell you all this to answer your question. That's the kind of density we expect to see inside the neighborhoods in the suburbs. On the edges of the neighborhoods in the suburbs, you might see the plaza convert to something that might be eight or, or eight stories or so and have ground floor retailing. Around the, the transit, you're going to have more density and more height. In the downtown, you're going to have even more. It's not a one size fits all. You, you take a smart strategic approach to your density. You tie it to where the infrastructure is in place, where people can get around without the car. And you take a very smart and fine-grained approach to density. Doesn't mean you're going to try to put tall buildings everywhere. But there's very few places that can just say, no, we don't want to change. We like it exactly the way that it is. And even if you could say that successfully, it's not necessarily in your best interest. Because guess what? Your school might be under threat of closure because you don't have kids in your neighborhood anymore. So it's it's change is a fascinating thing in cities. People think they can prevent it. Often all they end up doing is preventing a, a kind of change that's well managed and actually, you know, pro protects some of the things they like in their neighborhood. Well, wasn't it Jane Jacobs who uh, who said something like uh, the organic growth of cities is far better than that planned by uh, by planners? And uh, I think that probably is right. Well, most of the and she's talking about when planners tried to stop things, often stop change. You know what 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 she was always for was get rid of the planning rules to let more density happen. It was when planners tried to keep change from happening that actually caused the trouble. We're chatting tonight with Brent Todrin, uh, who came to Mississauga just last week to talk about the next 50 years in Mississauga. It was really quite a fascinating presentation. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just two minutes with Brent. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Brent Todrin, who uh, who came to Mississauga just last week to uh, a, a presentation in the Living Arts Centre to talk about the next 50 years in Mississauga and and really, I think, challenge a lot of us uh, in regards to the type of city that uh, that we are building, that, that we want to build uh, in the future. And uh, it was about 900 people, over 900 people that came. It was a good crowd. Uh, and I think uh, you did a good job, Brent, of, of really raising people's awareness and, and asking a lot of questions. Let me ask you a few questions, uh, if I could. Uh, you know, one of the things about the urban plan in Mississauga today is the height's supposed to be downtown, and then it's supposed to be less high everywhere else around the city. And I think one of the reasons why that was put in place is because, frankly, around square one, there weren't a lot of neighbors. There weren't, uh, you know, established neighborhoods. And so, therefore, it was far easier to get, uh, get things approved. Toronto was different. Toronto... Um, did have, you know, the height around uh, Young Street and Blur and Young, uh, et cetera, but is now allowing height in a lot of other places, North York, Scarborough, Cloverdale, uh, Weston Road, uh, you know, down in Humber uh, Bay, et cetera. Uh, and right now there's a, is, there's, there's a question, should there be tall towers 
uh, in other areas around GO train stations, other major nodes? Or should you try to keep all that height and density in in downtown? And 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 connected to that, the downtown's really not a true downtown because it it doesn't have a lot of offices. You know, it's primarily residential and a shopping center. Uh, and so it's not the kind of mixed use downtown that a lot of other downtowns have. So question is, should all the height and density be in one spot or can you spread it out and have it in other nodes? Well, first of all, your your Mississauga plan has already answered that question. You don't need me to come to town to to tell you to do something different. And by the way, I, I, want, I want your your listeners to to understand the truth. I didn't just come to town to do a talk. My talk was part of work I'm doing with the city of Mississauga. I've actually been advising the city for about six months and it's an ongoing thing. I'm pro providing them advice on a lot of things. So I'm I'm part of these conversations about the planning for the city. The plan you already have been working on calls for density in places other than the downtown. The downtown is probably going to be for as long as all of us are alive, the tallest. There are no height limits in the downtown now, and that's why there's very tall buildings. And it's not just because it's an easy place to get height because no one's complaining. It's because that's a, you, that's an important place to have what I call body heat, the population density that can create these interrelationships between the different elements and pieces of the puzzle of a good downtown. You're quite right. Um, how do I say this? Uh, Mississauga's downtown was one of the very first in Canada that, that actually tried to create a brand new downtown that out of a former center. suburban place, a shopping center. And you became an inspiration to other cities and all those other places you're talking about in, in Toronto. Remember, those places were originally suburbs before they were annexed as part of, of, of the city of Toronto. They were places like Mississauga that didn't have a downtown and they were sort of trying to create one. And across all of the GTA, you can't swing a stick without hitting a, sub a suburb that's trying to create a real downtown. And what I say is, it's hard to create a real downtown from a suburban place. And when I'm working for cities that are trying to do it, I say, are you trying to create a real urban place or are you just trying to create a much higher density suburb? And what I mean by that is Mississauga still made their downtown mostly about the car. And downtowns are not mostly about cars. They're not. Uh, but the Mississauga scale was still scaled to the car. The LRT wasn't there yet. You know, the, the, and still isn't there yet, but it's coming. Uh, so it's mostly about cars. And you didn't even have very many things to walk between and walk to. Well, and so it was the, mostly about cars. You you made the comment on Wednesday that, uh, you know, walking around square one around the downtown of Mississauga is not frankly easy. And it's not uh, it's not the, the nicest thing. But we do have places oh. that are like that. Uh, I'm not sure in your in your six months in working Mississauga, if you've had the chance to walk through Port Credit or walk yep. through streets. Yep. But we've got some beautiful villages uh, and main yes. streets uh, in those villages with great restaurants and bars and, and 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 local boutiques and shops and things like that. But they're struggling and they're struggling because of COVID. They're struggling because of competition with the malls uh, and they're struggling because of uh, competition with with square one in downtown. And they're struggling because they're in a car dependent city, because that means they are dependent on people getting to them. And the constant conversation is about where will they park? Right. And because so the they're in a that, city that the question, where the assumption is if you're going to go anywhere, you're going to do it by car. And there's not much density around them to provide that walkable body heat. And so that's the question I want to ask you. You know, if people have struggled. How do we make sure that Port Credit and Streetsville and there's other areas as well, but those are the two I want to talk about, don't die and they, they're vibrant in the future. Some people, people say don't don't have change. Other people say, no, build that density and add some more people. What's your answer? Well, you've made the point. They're struggling. They're going to change whether you like it or not. Do you want them to succeed? Do you want them to survive? You, you can maintain the, the heritage character of places, but around them in a walkable distance, you should have body heat. And it doesn't have to be the same kind of body heat as downtown. It probably shouldn't be. But you need the body heat that has people that can strengthen the, the that village character because there's people there and they can get there without you having to worry about parking that is the key so all those historic places that that got gobbled up by the suburbs as the suburbs grew they predated in many cases the suburbs that's why they've got that village character and charm sometimes 
um, they they now need the body heat that actually will keep them alive in the in the modern economy. So that's why we're talking about different kinds of density in different kinds of places. There's probably density everywhere, but it's strategic density of different kinds in different places. And the point of it is to create walkable body heat, transit support. If you've got the bike infrastructure, which you don't yet, but you, you need, you're going to need to have, then you've got the biking support too. And yes, you have the car, but you're not dependent on the car for those places to survive. All of that, you know, this is there's nothing simple about what I'm talking about. It's like three-dimensional chess. And yet we usually have a very sim overly simplistic conversation about yes or no, I like density, I don't like height. And but you're trying to maintain ecosystems and keep them alive and thriving in parts of your city that are very complex. And so the conversation is hard. The, the decisions that council makes are hard. The, the narrative from the NIMBY discourse is often very overly simplistic. And so when I challenge cities, I'm challenging their staff to do a better job of communicating all of this because we somehow make inherently interesting cities mind-numbingly boring when we talk about them. It's remarkable how boring my profession of city planning usually is. Um, and I challenge politicians to not just listen to the loudest people who have said that they've been here whole their, their whole life and they don't want it to change at all, because Mississauga is an incredibly diverse city. It's one of the most diverse cities in Canada, and that's just increasing. And frankly, for cities to survive from a taxation perspective, et cetera, you need young people working. You need young people paying taxes. But young people uh, can't live. Young people can't afford to, to live in Mississauga. Young people are moving to Georgetown and Dalliston and uh, Brantford because uh, young people can't live to live in the same cities that their parents raised them in. Because expensive. we're not providing the housing options. But that's what this whole conversation is about. We're talking about we're not talking about turning Mississauga into Toronto. We're not talking about turning Mississauga into Vancouver. We're not talking about turning it into anything except a better version of itself. Because how Mississauga was in the past when the baby boomers were all working, because we're all going through a, a, a demographic crisis too, how Mississauga worked when the baby boomers were all working is not how Mississauga can work when the baby boomers are all retired. Okay, so I uh, you, it just doesn't work that way. I got to ask you, Brent, is is the problem here the people or is it the planners and uh, and the city councillors? Uh, you know, StatsCan did an analysis that said that uh, Canada is one of the slowest countries in the world to approve uh, zoning changes, building permits, etc. And that in that, Toronto, Mississauga and Victoria are, are the worst offenders. I think Vancouver was up there as well. Uh, uh, in all of Canada, the slowest to actually approve building permits and zoning changes. Um, and, and, you know, the red tape and regulation, some people think it takes longer, twice as long to get something approved as it is to actually build it. Isn't that the problem? Uh, that's certainly a big part of the problem, a big part of the challenge. You know, you can, I've heard, I've heard, people blame it on NIMBYs. I've heard people blame it on politicians for not having the political bravery to do the right thing when they know better, just to keep their jobs, as you said. And by the way, I don't even buy that narrative. I've seen brave politicians who are good communicators do something that isn't necessarily popular, but they, they challenge their own voters to understand why this is really hard. And guess what? They get it reelected. So there's a lazy narrative that says, you know, if I if I do anything except mindlessly obey uh, the misinformed perspectives of, of, of city change, I will lose my job. You know, that's that's not true in my experience. And I've been doing this for a long time. So I think we all have to challenge ourselves to, first of all, understand the facts. The point of Wednesday night was to start a conversation in Mississauga that frankly doesn't exist here, but that exists in a lot of other cities where you're talking about the truth of city building, why city building is so hard and why we need a fundamental conversation about how to do it differently because the status quo isn't working. Because people are out there saying, I want to... I want to have responsible change to mitigate climate emergency. And my kids do need housing and it's too expensive and they can't live here. And by the way, uh, I don't like my taxes rising and, and all of this. And yet 
as soon as the things are proposed that would improve those, they fight against them because there is a fundamental disconnect. Maybe it's a lack of understanding. Maybe people do know and they don't care. But you got to have that conversation in cities. In my experience around the world, I was asked on Wednesday night, you may recall, what's the one thing that cities that are doing this better have? Or what's the one thing you would start with, Brent, if cities are want to do better? And my answer was various versions of the better conversation. The cities that are doing better, you can't swing a stick on a on a on a given weeknight without some conversation about better city building, whether it's about housing or transportation or social equity or climate change or what have you. It's just constant and ubiquitous. The media is constantly talking about it. Uh, it's just a ubiquitous conversation about why the status quo isn't necessarily working for everyone, even though it might be you might think it's working for you. Uh, if you don't have that conversation, when something gets proposed, like a tall building or a bike lane, it tends to be this bloodbath of angry people. It so I, it's it, Wednesday was a start. It was a start to try to create something uh, that is the constant conversation, the challenging conversation that isn't easy, but it's truth telling in an era where we need to be blunt. And as I started my talk on Wednesday, I'm known for my bluntness. Well, I think that uh, the bluntness was well called for because I think there's a lot of people uh, on city council uh, in, in planning uh, in, in Mississauga that need to hear what you've got to say. There's just no question about it. Uh, we're going to take a break, a final break, and come back with some concluding comments with Ben Brent Todrin in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm chatting right now with Brent Todrin. He's a city planning expert, uh, used to be the chief uh, city planner in Vancouver, made a name for himself there before that, Calgary, before that, Ontario. And now he's got his uh, city planning consulting uh, companies come to Mississauga to help us figure out the next 50 years of Mississauga. Brent, I got to ask you, you know, we had in Mississauga this uh, downtown vision 2021. It was pretty exciting, but not much happened. Uh, and and the streets that were laid out and the visioning that uh, was there didn't happen. So, you know, what good is what you're doing? What good is uh, this whole planning process? Will it ever come to pass? Will we build this city? You know, where should we point the fingers as to who's not doing their job? Well, I don't know it's about doing the job because as we pointed out, uh, it's very hard for planners to uh, get plans realized when uh, the politicians are listening to the community that doesn't want to change more than they're listening to the planners. And I think that is very true of Mississauga for as long as I've been a planner. I remember 32 years ago when I started my career, I remember the reputation of Mississauga at that time. And I got to tell you, the reputation was if you're a good planner that wants to do important work, don't go to Mississauga. That is, I'm being really blunt. Why? So uh, because it's it, because it's status quo, they're just going to listen to the folks that don't want any change and and you're not going to be able to change much. But isn't political leadership all about knowing where you've got to go in the future and, and trying to lead people there? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I As I said, I've worked with hundreds of politicians and there's politicians who know that sometimes the most important things you will do are the unpopular things. But they are the things that it's your job to not just go with the wind, but teach your people. Listen, but also teach. That's what leaders do. It's not leadership when you're only doing what they tell you to do. That's by definition is following. So there are city, there are leaders that know that you have to challenge the status quo and it's your job to be persuasive and to make the case. And then there's others who say, no, I was elected to do whatever my constituents say, and let's be honest, what that really means is what the loudest constituents who do most of the talking say, because most of the people in our communities almost never get involved in these uh, then conversations. Why don't we elect a politician? Why don't we just hire a polling firm? Yeah, well, there, I've literally heard that suggested. But here's my here's my point. I think if we have a better conversation about uh, that's truth based as opposed to fake news based and challenge ourselves at by with a better job of connecting the dots because i know that canadians care about the housing crisis the climate crisis etc 
But often the whole process, the whole conversation doesn't connect the dots. You know, if you're, it's like saying, um, I want to get in shape, but I don't, I refuse to eat better exercise or ever go to my doctor. You know, you, you, we've got to connect the dots between the thing you say you want and what it would take to actually achieve it. One of the things I do with cities when I first start working with them is I find the thing that they say they want to achieve. I showed that on Wednesday. Kingston, when I started working for them, had said they want to become the most sustainable city in Canada. And I said, all right, let's talk about what it would really take to achieve that. Guelph, when I started working for them, said, we want to drop our per capita greenhouse gas emissions by 63% by 2030 in eight years. And I said, based on what you're actually doing right now, it would take till 2050 or never. So let's have a conversation about it. what, it, what it would really take. That's not my vision. I'm not telling them what the vision should be. I'm telling them the truth that there is a fundamental disconnect between what you claim you say you want to achieve and what you're actually doing. And so uh, uh, that's a challenge for the politicians. It's a challenge for the city planners who have to be more follow through oriented, not just plan making, but action. And we have to act like we're in an emergency. We have to act like this is a crisis. And so far, most of our city halls are still going the same speed. So often my work with cities is sometimes it's new ideas. Sometimes it's different ideas. Often it's just taking this thing you say you are going to do, but instead of doing it in 27 years, you do it in three because that's what you do in an emergency. I think we're in an emergency. I think that you're completely right. Uh, it was interesting. You did a poll and people said that uh, the cost of living was uh, the biggest issue uh, facing Mississauga residents today, which is not just housing affordability, because uh, we we right. have a housing crisis, but it's it's everything associated with uh, the cost to actually uh, live today. And I think transportation is a really big cost in our life. And I think we need to do a better job in that regard. And I think you challenged us uh, all to think a little bit about that. And so I really appreciate you coming to town and uh, challenging us. I got to tell you, uh, I happen to be in Vancouver right now and had the pleasure of walking around the city and seeing some of the developments that uh, that you've built here in uh, in Vancouver uh, and walked along, uh, uh, you know, Davy and Denman and saw the density that's in behind beautiful retail uh, strips that are very live with uh, that, that uh, you know, the heat uh, that you talked about uh, from the, the populations around that and some of the developments in False Creek, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think we could learn a lot from what you've done uh, here in uh, Vancouver. Helps that you've got the big, beautiful Stanley Park. Uh, by the way, we've got a huge park in uh, downtown Mississauga that's just as big, maybe not as Stan Stanley Park, but as Central Park. And it's mm -hmm. and it's not developed. It's not contiguous. It's not uh, it's not known. And so I think there's there's a lot we could learn from uh, from you and from Vancouver. I uh, appreciate you coming to town. That's our show. Well, for the I'll just say, I think cities can learn from all cities. And I, I do not come to town saying, do what Vancouver did. I think, I think there's a lot of cities that Mississauga can learn from, but I also am really excited because as I said, Mississauga was one of the first cities that tried to do a suburban downtown. So I think Mississauga in 10 years, we could be talking about what Mississauga has been teaching North American cities instead of just learning. But the truth is it's always both. You're always teaching, you're always learning. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us, Brent. Really appreciate it. You, uh, you, I think, are going to have a positive impact on uh, Mississauga and probably a lot of other cities. Appreciate it. Thanks. My pleasure. Good night, everybody.